in which context uh, the, 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 the birth of complexity are you most interested in? Well, I think it comes in stages, right? So I think that if you go from the, the uh, I'm a, again, a physicist. So biologists studying evolution will talk about, you know, how complexity evolves all the time, the complexity of the genome, the complexity of our physiology, right? But they take for granted that life already existed, you know, and, and entropy is increasing and so forth. I want to go back to the beginning and say the early universe was simple and low entropy, and entropy increases with time, and the universe sort of differentiates and becomes more complex. But that that statement, which is indisputably true, has different meanings, because complexity has different meanings. So sort of the most basic primal version of complexity is, is what you might think of as configurational complexity. That's what Kamal Grove gets at. How much information do you need to specify the configuration of the system? Then there's a whole other step where subsystems of the universe start burning fuel, right? So in many ways, a planet and a star are not that different in configurational complexity. They're both spheres with density high at the middle and getting less as you go out. But there's something fundamentally different because the star only survives as long as it has fuel, right? I mean, then it turns into a brown dwarf or a white dwarf or whatever, but as a star, as a main sequence star, it is an out of equilibrium system, but it's more or less static, right? Like if I spill the coffee mug and it falls, in the process of falling, it's out of equilibrium, but it's also changing all the time. A specific kind of system is where it looks sort of macroscopically stationary, like a star, but underneath the hood, it's burning fuel to beat the band in order to maintain that stability. So as stars form, that, that's a different kind of complexity that comes to be. Then there's another kind of complexity that comes to be, roughly speaking, at the origin of life, because that's where you have information really being gathered and utilized by subsystems of the universe. And then arguably, there's any number of stages past that. I mean, one of the most obvious ones to me is, we talk about simulation theory, but you and I run simulations in our heads. They're just not that good, but we imagine different hypothetical futures, right? Bacteria don't do that. So that's the kind of information processing that is a form of complexity. And so I would like to understand all these stages and how they fit together. Yeah, imagination. Yeah, mental time travel. Yeah, the, the things going on in my head when I'm imagining worlds are, are super compressed representations of those worlds, but they get to the essence of them. And maybe it's possible with non-human computing type devices to do those kinds of simulations in more and more compressed ways. There's an argument to be made that literally what separates human beings from other species on Earth is our ability to imagine counterfactual hypothetical futures. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the big features. I don't know if it's a it, Everyone has their own favorite little feature, but that is, uh, that's why I said there's an argument to be made. I did a podcast episode on it with Adam Bully. It developed slowly. I did a di different podcast. Sorry to keep mentioning podcast episodes I did, but Malcolm McIver, who is an engineer at Northwestern, has a theory about um, one of the major stages in evolution is when fish first climbed onto land. And if, I mean, of course, that is a major stage of evolution, but in particular, there's a cognitive shift because when you're a fish swimming under the water, the attenuation length of light in water is not that long. You can't see kilometers away. You can see meters away. And you're moving at meters per second. So all of the evolutionary optimization is make all of your decisions on a time scale of less than a second. <laughs> when you see something new, you have to make a rapid fire decision what to do about it. As soon as you climb onto land, you can essentially see forever, right? You can see stars in the sky. Um, so now a whole new mode of reasoning opens up where you see something far away. And rather than saying, look up table, I see this, I react. You can say, okay, I see that thing. What if I did this? What if I did that? What if I did something different? And, and that's you know, the birth of imagination eventually.